So what happened on Good Friday? It seems to be a silly question. Of course we know what happened. The night before, Jesus had been betrayed by Judas. He had been deserted by all the disciples. He had been denied three times by Peter. He was falsely accused by some unnamed, inconsistent accusers. He had been subjected to illegal trials. Three of them, actually three of the five, were completely illegal. There were intense beatings. There was ejection by both Herod and Pilate. He died, we know, one of the most excruciating and painful deaths imaginable hung on a cross, forced to lift himself by both hands and feet that had been impaled to a wooden cross, hung naked and exposed for six hours, fighting for each breath he had to lift himself by both hands and feet, being ridiculed by the religious leaders and one of the thieves who hung beside him. Only John and Mary were there, deserted. Eventually, breathing his last, he utters a single phrase, it is finished. This is the day that God became king. Now, that might be somewhat of a silly assertion to make. Well, of course, God is king. He's always been king, hasn't he? I mean, he created the universe and he, he rules in authority. Yes. And in a sense, no, he hadn't always been king, at least not as far as human beings are concerned. His dethronement came in the Garden of Eden. We read about it in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees of the garden, but God did say you should not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman. Did for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit was the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for making gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and, and he ate it. And then we hear the sad consequences. And when their eyes of both of them were open, they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. It's obvious God had been enthroned prior to his rejection by Adam and Eve. He had created all that existed, and all that existed lived for the purpose of being in submission to him and giving glory to him. He was to be honored in all of life by all of creation. All of life was in perfect peace and harmony. When Adam and Eve rebelled, all that changed. God was dethroned from his rightful place as sovereign in the universe, and they seated themselves on the throne with their own lives. This did not end well for Adam and Eve or the rest of the creation either when God is not enthroned. But a promise was made at that time for an enthronement. Speaking to Satan, God says, he will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Verse 15. There was going to be a time in which what had come into play was to be reversed, and that was with the coming of the promised king. The king was promised. Initially, it was promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country and your people and your household and go to the land I will show you, and I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll bless you. Make your name great, and he will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll ever curse you, I'll curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. A new humanity was starting through Abraham. This is actually the third time this had happened. The first humanity was with, with Adam. It had ended badly. And that was the fact is that Adam and Eve sinned. They rebelled against it. And so there needed to be a new start, Genesis chapter 6. The flood came. All of humanity was destroyed except for Noah and his family. And, and in Genesis chapter 7, there is the beginning of yet a new creation, as it were. The earth has been purged of evil. It was starting over again. And yet that quickly failed. The chapter hadn't even gone long at all before Sam, Noah becomes drunk. Ham shames his father. And once again, there's a stories of degradation. For the third time now, God's starting over. And he's starting over with a man 
from Ur of the Chaldees, a man by the name of Abraham, a former idol worshiper, one who to whom God revealed himself. And he says, I'm going to make a nation. I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to make a great nation out of your descendants. And all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. There was a promise of a nation. But if you have a nation, you have to have a ruler. And who is the ruler? Well, it's supposed to be, it was to be God himself. And this kingdom was to be universal. All the peoples, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And we find throughout the Old Testament, this is repeated on numerous occasions. It's clarified for us actually in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11, where God is making a new covenant now with David, giving him a promise of one of his descendants was going to be the king, the king that promised, king that was going to last forever. Nathan the prophet says this to, to, to David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When, when your days are over and you rest from your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. My love will never be taken away from him. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And this promise was articulated again and again, that God was going to come and establish a, a kingdom with, with a king. The king, the coming king, was announced by Jesus. In the beginning of Mark's gospel, he says this, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. And we leave the good news. Fascinating introduction that Jesus has to, to his kingdom. Mark's gospel is unusual in the fact that there is no birth narrative. There's no genealogy. There is no trying to make a connection between uh, his coming and his ministry. It simply begins with his ministry. He's, he simply announced in bold terms. It's stark, in a sense, context which was there. The, the Roman citizens would have recognized this very clearly. The Christians who lived in Rome would have recognized the form which was there. It was in the form of a regal announcement. A regal announcement such in the sense we see when the president gives the, the, the State of the Union address, the sergeant of arms comes into the chamber, boldly announces the president of the United States and everyone stands and those who support him applaud. Everyone recognizes who the most important room, person in the room is. At that point, it's, it's president of the United States. It's, there's no question about this. In the context of this announcement, there's no question who the most important person is. It's Jesus. The kingdom of God is near. And with that royal declaration, he gives a royal command. Repent. A command. Telling people, repent. Not asking them to. Not begging them to. Commanding them to. Repent. And believe the good news that King Jesus demands our attention because he comes to establish a kingdom which is totally unlike any other. It doesn't have a geographic territory, doesn't have a singular language or single ethnicity. It's one which lives within the hearts of those who are his followers. In Luke chapter 17, verse 20, we find this. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. These were individuals who thought they understood the times as we would all want to do. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because he says, Jesus says to his, to these Pharisees, and some of whom later became his followers, the kingdom of God is within you. It's a different kind of kingdom. Later, we find Luke's gospel, the kingdom of God belongs to little children, and those who enter must become like little children. Luke chapter 18, verse 15, we find this episode. The people were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. Kids are a waste of time as far as the disciples were concerned. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it at all. The kingdom of God belongs to all, the old, the young. Entry is like a child. What's a child like? Child, children have, we call them gullible. 
They, they believe adults, they trust adults, they rely upon adults. When adults makes a, a promise to go to Dairy Queen or take them to the ball game, they never forget these things. Why? Because they believe the promise. Jesus said, if we don't become like that, believing, trusting, staking our hopes and our aspirations, our joys upon what he has promised to us will never enter the kingdom of God. We have to become like little children. This is a kingdom that is unlike any other. This is a kingdom eventually which becomes global. It becomes transnational. It is one that encompasses people of, as we learn in the book of Revelation, people of every kindred, tribe, nation, language, and tongue, individuals that come together from all places on the earth. It's, it's a kingdom like any other. But the question is, when did Jesus, when did God become king? Well, he became king by dying on the cross. Now, one would say, well, wait a minute, what happened? What happened then a previous previous Sunday when Jesus entered into Jerusalem? What happened in New Enter into Jerusalem was a declaration of the king. Actually, it was the anointing of the king. It was a promise of the king. It was saying, here is the king. But the king, Jesus, entered his enthronement on the cross. That sounds weird, doesn't it? What kind of king is coronated on a cross by dying? Well, the same kind of king that leaves all of the blessings of eternity, as Paul would Put it in Philippians chapter 2, he did not regard equality with God something to grasp, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. He humbled himself, became obedient even to death on a cross. What kind of king is born in the manger? What kind of king is born in poverty? Same kind of king that eventually dies on a cross to declare his authority. Like everything in life, in the life of Jesus, his death on the cross is a paradox. It's two truths held simultaneously together, and we get the meaning only out of the when they are put together. While earthly monarchs would demand adoration, pomp, and circumstance and ascendancy to their respective thrones, Jesus chose the role of a servant, rejected, abandoned by all, regarded as shameful by all who were there. In a sense, when he died on the cross, he was, he was repulsive to all but the flies that gathered on his flesh. And yet, it was on the cross when Jesus dethroned Satan from as being the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of the air, as it were, the ruler of this world. And Jesus was enthroned as God and sovereign over the universe on the throne. This is when we find that Jesus, the king, became ruler of all, when God became king. Put it this way, Paul would state what happened in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Speaking of our own situation, he said, you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. God made you alive. He forgave all our sins. And then he says, how did he pull this off? Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. In other words, the law that, that condemned us because we condemned ourselves by our inobedience to our inability to follow it. Jesus obliterated that. He obliterated it by fulfilling it. He took it away. He, he nailed it to the cross. And, and this is what he did then to the evil powers which were there. He, having disarmed the, the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus became king on the cross. He vanquished all of the evil forces, subjecting them to his rule, saying that he is now king he is the one who is worthy, only one worthy of being worshipped. John records the last words of Jesus as these, it is finished. In the Greek language in which the New Testament is written, it is a singular word, tetelestai, stated in the perfect tense. Jesus says in the facts, it is 
fully completed. There, there's nothing else which is left. What had been promised since the Garden of Eden when God was cast, was cast from his rightful place through the rebellion of the first humans, promised again to Abraham, later to David, later again through all the prophets, predicted by those who see it, saw what was coming in a distant future, now is completed. King Jesus has taken his place as conqueror of sin and death. He has defeated the power of Satan and would be validated on the third day by rising again from the dead. It is finished. Tetelestai, Satan has been defeated. The debt of sin has been paid. The wrath of God has been satisfied. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament have been fulfilled in, 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 our, in Christ. The kingdom of God has come in defeating the cosmic powers of the, earth, of the universe. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. It is finished. Christ, our righteousness, we have become righteous in him. It is finished. It is complete. So what does it mean when God becomes king? Several things. First of all, we recognize who's been defeated. It's been Satan. So often we kind of have this misnomer, this, 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 this idea that in a sense, you know, God is on one side and Satan is the other, and they're, they're duking it out, and we humans are between. We're kind of wondering, oh, who, 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 who's going who's gonna to win? That is absolutely nonsensical to the writers of the New Testament. They say very clearly on the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. In this marvelous chapter in Revelation chapter 12, it certainly is well worth going and reading. It gives kind of the sense that you know, the marvelous summary of all of history, it kind of encapsulates everything that God has done. You have this, this vision of this pregnant woman who gives birth to this, this man child, this man child who will reign the nations with an iron scepter. Then you have this dragon that, that comes and, and, and harasses and intimidates the, the woman who is there. And, and then the woman is, is protected and, and she is taken in a safe place. And, and Satan goes off. He's, he's still making war against you know, the, 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 the children of the woman, with the descendants. And he then defines these things. Like, who's, who's, this, who's the dragon? Well, it's Satan. Who's, who are the, the children? Well, those who hold to the commands of Jesus. Who is the man child? It's, it's Christ. But the point is, it also says that, that Satan was cast from heaven. He was thrown out. I mean, think about it. You get disgusted with somebody in your house, you throw them out. <laughs> Gone. Gone. Yeah. You know, they can still do a mess. They can mess stuff up. But frankly, there's no question who's in authority. No question at all. So enables us as Christ followers. We see evil in the world. Yeah, there's evil in the world. Satan is still out. But roaring wine, seeking those who devour you. Wrecks havoc and all sorts of things. But we know who's God. We know who's king. We know that it, Satan's time is short. Nothing to be afraid of. Satan has been defeated. It's over with. Decision made 2,000 years ago. Second thing which happened is that the debt of sin has been paid. My sin, your sin. We, we don't have to try to earn anything by, by good deeds. It's been paid. We we respond in an attitude of love and passion for Christ who gave himself fully to us with joy. Third thing which happens is that the wrath of God has been satisfied. That Jesus himself is the propitiation, the final payment, paying a penalty for our sin, paying and satisfying the wrath of God. God is not going to deal with us according to his wrath. He deals with us now in his love because his wrath has been fully satisfied. It's been finished. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament have reached their fulfillment. For Christ, our sacrifice has been slain for us. It's been finished. The kingdom of God has come in defeating the cosmic forces of evil. So what is it then when God becomes king for us? Let me suggest two things found in the book of Ephesians. First of all, we are reconciled to God, and we are also reconciled to one another. 
the world remains a, a place of deep division. We hear discussions all the time of, of racism, racial attitudes, and disparities between ethnicities and disparities even amongst ethnic groups. The kingdom of God, all these things are really rendered meaningless. Hear what the scriptures say, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he, that is Christ, himself is our peace, who made the two one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing this flesh, the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those of you who are far away and peace to those of you who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. What, what's being talked about here? He's talking about the fact that the world has always been a divided place. We always, in a sense, want to think of ourselves as better than somebody else because of the color of our skin or the color of their skin or the ethnic background that we have and scriptures say that's nonsense it's totally irrelevant what really matters is that we belong to christ that we're forgiven people and what really matters is that my my brother or sister it really doesn't matter how much melanin is in their skin or what country they came from or where they are at they're my brother they're my sister and i need to treat them with love and respect and acceptance and honor them in any way that i can he, he's come to to reconcile ourselves to god he's come to reconcile ourselves to one another in christ he's come to remind us that we are now the citizens of this earthly kingdom of christ is our king and he is our king what does that make us it makes us the citizens of that kingdom it gives to us a place of belonging, which is there. We are forgiven people who are made citizens in this new kingdom. Let, let's read on in from Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or aliens. You're no longer people on the outside. But fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a, a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What has happened here? What has happened here has been the fact that on the cross, Jesus put into reverse all of the things that had been happening on the earth from the beginning of creation until that point. What had been happening? Division deceit, alienation, shame, guilt, running away. It's all the things that Adam and Eve experienced and it was passed down from one generation to another. In Christ, he reverses all of that. He reverses all of that by taking away any reasons for being alienated, any reasons for being separated, any reasons for being ashamed, any reasons for feeling of any false sense of inferiority or even a false sense of superiority. Why? Because on the cross, God became king and beckons us to live into his kingdom and even to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive one another. Oh God, may we pray these words with joy, anticipation of knowing you, experiencing you. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Oh God, oh Lord Jesus, you became king when you died on the cross. We welcome you, our king, into our lives into our families, into our church, into our community. In your name we pray. Amen.